In the 1960s, England had two really big cultural exports. One of them was the Beatles, and the other was James Bond films. Both of these hit our shores the same day in 1962. The Beatles released their hit, Love Me Do, and that was the same day that the James Bond adventure hit the big screen, and that was titled Dr. No. The movie is a spy film that's directed by Terrence Young, and it's originally based on the 1958 novel that has the same name that was written by Ian Fleming. The movie stars Sean Connery, Ursula Andress, Joseph Wiseman, and Jack Lord. This is the very first film in the James Bond series. In the film, James Bond is sent to Jamaica to investigate the disappearance of a fellow British agent. The trail ends up leading him to an underground base of Dr. No. He's actually plotting to disrupt an early American space launch from Cape Canaveral using a radio beam weapon. This film was produced on a very low budget. So it made Dr. No a very successful film as far as the box office was concerned because its original cost was so low. The film actually received mixed critical reaction upon its release. But over time, it has gained a reputation that it's one of the series' best installments. This movie kind of launched the genre of the secret agent films that flourished in the 1960s. Now, in the opening sequence of the film, you look down the barrel of a gun to see Agent 007. This was designed by Maurice Bender, but you need to know that the actual actor that you see at the end of the barrel is not Sean Connery, but it's stuntman Bob Simmons. Sean Connery didn't actually film that sequence until he did Thunderball in 1965. One of the little Easter eggs that you see in this film is the painting of the Duke of Wellington. This painting shows up in the movie, but the fact is that this painting was stolen in 1961 from London's National Gallery. But you actually see this on an easel next to the stairs in Dr. No's dining area. And this is why Bond actually stops to notice it as he passes when he's going up the stairs. This painting was actually recovered in 1965. It said that this was really big news in England at the time. So the British audiences noticed it as soon as they saw it in the film. And they laughed out loud because they knew about the theft. Now, of course, the one you see in the film is a duplicate made to look like their original painting. Now, the novelist Ian Fleming borrowed James Bond's name from a guy who wrote the book Birds of the West Indies. He thought that this name was plain and simple and was the perfect name for an undercover agent. Even though if you really look at Bond, he's probably the least inconspicuous spy ever. And as far as the 007, where did that come from? That supposedly is the number of the London bus route that Fleming sometimes rode. Now, we always think of James Bond as being British, but during the development of Dr. No, Fleming actually wrote the filmmakers a memo insisting that they realize the danger of making the series seem too English. The big thing is they didn't use any blatant English slang, things that were called limey-type gimmicks. Initially, the filmmakers tried to cast the lead role by hosting a nationwide Find James Bond contest in England. The stunt did have some publicity value, but the filmmakers had no intention of casting the winner. The winner was actually Peter Anthony. He was a model that had no acting experience at all. Needless to say, he didn't get the part. Lois Maxwell was initially up for the role of Sylvia Trench, who becomes Bond's friend with benefits after he meets her at the Baccarat table early in the film. But Lois Maxwell kind of balked at the idea and thought the role was just too sexy, especially because there was one scene that she would have been required to wear nothing but one of Bond's shirts. This role eventually went instead 
to Eunice Grayson, and Maxwell went on to play the flirtatious secretary, Miss Moneypenny. Now, John Barry's instantly recognizable big band arrangement of the James Bond theme music, first used for Dr. No, has defined the 007 character and spy movie music in general for a long time. Actually, the composer Monty Norman based the Bond theme on a song called Bad Sign, Good Sign that he had written for a never-produced stage musical. Now, as detailed as Dr. No's underwater lair was, one vital element was very nearly forgotten. That was background plates of fish swimming in the sea. They quickly found this necessary footage among a library of footage that they had the day before the scene was to be filmed. Then it turned out that the footage ended up being extremely close footage of fish. So it was decided to have Dr. No explain this illusion by saying that the window worked like a magnifying glass. Initially, Ian Fleming didn't want to cast Sean Connery as James Bond. See, Bond was English and Connery was Scottish. Bond was from an upper class background and Sean Connery came from a real working class background. Bond was refined and educated and Connery was way too rugged. Once Fleming saw the final cut of the movie, he realized that Sean Connery was the perfect fit for this casting. It's kind of interesting to note that the very first time that Sean Connery gets in front of the camera and actually plays James Bond, the very first filming sequence is in the Kingston Airport where he passes a female photographer and he holds his hat up in front of his face. That filming date was January 16, 1962. Now, Sean Connery's suits for the film were made by a Seville Row tailor named Anthony Sinclair. Sinclair actually stated that a truly great suit would be able to stand up to a good deal of abuse, such as somebody grabbing the lapels and it's still looking good afterwards. To prove this point, Sean Connery was asked to sleep in the suit When he woke up the next morning, he was stunned to see that the suit looked fantastic. Two weeks before the filming was scheduled to start, the part of Honey Rider was still not cast. The producers then saw a photograph of a then little-known Ursula Andress, and she was in a wet t-shirt. They offered her the part without even meeting her. Those wet t-shirts have a lot of influence. Now, Honey Rider emerging from the sea is one of the most iconic scenes in the James Bond film franchise. And this made Ursula Andress famous to this day. Ursula Andress is completely bewildered by this. She says that it's a mystery. All I did was wear this bikini, not even a small one, and boom, overnight she was a star. I guess being a female, she doesn't understand that. But if you're a male, you can relate to it. You know why it put her on the map. Her payment for this role was $6,000. Now that white bikini that she wore actually sold at Christie's Auctions in London on February 14, 2001 for 35,000 pounds. Now that bikini top originally was made from an underwire bra that was sold by Saks Fifth Avenue in New York. The costume designer Tessa Wellborn ordered three of the bras. She covered them in cotton and refined the design. After the movie's release, bikini swimwear sales went through the roof. Now let's talk about the tough Sean Connery. One thing about Sean Connery was that he was morbidly afraid of spiders. In the movie, the shot of the spider in his bed was done with a sheet of glass between him and the spider. He demanded it. They went ahead and did the shooting, and they didn't really like the way all the images looked, so they decided to shoot some more scenes that were more close up, and they used a stuntman, Bob Simmons, to do the work. Bob Simmons said that that tarantula scene scared Sean Connery to death. He said it was the scariest stunt that he'd ever performed. Even though there was a sheet of glass there, he was petrified. It's kind of funny to know that they actually gave this tarantula a name 
and it was rosy. Now, contrary to what most people believe, Sean Connery was not wearing a hairpiece in the first two times that he played James Bond. Although he was already balding at the time, but he still had a decent amount of hair, and the filmmakers were able to use varying techniques to make that hair look thicker. By the time he filmed Goldfinger in 1964, his hair was just too thin, so they had to use various toupees for the rest of the Bond outings. This movie's release in the United States was actually stalled by the political climate after the Cuban Missile Crisis. That said, that President John F. Kennedy was a big fan of the James Bond novels, but he only lived to see this movie. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, just one month after From Russia With Love from 1963 was released in the UK. The movie eventually premiered in the US in April of 1964. But it's said that this is the very last movie that John F. Kennedy ever watched. What a great show this is. Take a look at this. You can actually watch this movie free on YouTube. It's one of the free movies that they offer. So take a look at it. It's fun to watch. It'll bring back a lot of memories. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.